Thank you all for joining today's webinar, Reaching the Community Through Urban Fishing Programs. We have three presenters today. First, we have Holly Richards with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Holly started as an environmental educator, park guide, and wilderness ranger uh, for the National Park Service. While working in remote parks across the West, she began to transition to digital engagement and finding new ways to connect people to nature using technology. She's worked for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for five years, specializing, specializing in web content, social media, and digital strategy. We'll also hear from Katrina Liebig and Marie Martin. Katrina is based in Anchorage, Alaska, where she works for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as a public affairs specialist. Fish are her primary focus, and much of her work revolves around fish, including the Urban Fishing Program, which she'll talk about um, in just a few minutes, and co-hosting an award-winning podcast called Fish of the Week. Marie has been working with Katrina for the past year and a half as an Alaska Geographic intern who helps lead the day-to-day -day urban fishing events in Anchorage and also hosts the virtual youth fish and wildlife club during the off season so that they can stay connected with the kids that they work with. She just started a year-long student conservation association internship with the service just this past week. So with that, I will turn it over to Holly. Thank you. There we go. Now I'm not muted. And I'll go ahead and turn my camera off for the duration, but I just wanted to wave at you guys for a second. Okay, well, welcome. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction, Joanne. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, and I just want to say hello to everyone on the call. It's so great that we can be here to share with you and then hopefully explore new ways of working together in the future. Um, uh, we all share a lot of the same goals. We have different strengths, however, our different agencies and organizations have a lot of different capacities. So it's really, um, I think it's what's really cool about our work is the opportunities to come together and find ways that we can bring those various strengths together um, for the benefit of other people. <clears throat> I will just um, go ahead and uh, introduce uh, someone that Joanne didn't, and that's my very loud elderly cat who may be yelling throughout the duration. So if you sounds like someone's being strangled in the background, everything is fine. <laughs> um, so as we get going here, I work with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. It's one of the oldest conservation agencies in the country. Um, it is, at its core, a wildlife conservation agency. Um, today we manage the list of threatened and endangered species with all of the regulatory and coordination work that that entails. Uh, we have a robust international affairs arm as well that deals not only with wildlife trafficking um, internationally, but also global conservation issues. Uh, we manage the National Wildlife Refuge System. It's one of the largest systems of protected lands and waters in the country because you can't protect wildlife if you're not protecting their habitat. And we work for the conservation of migratory birds, which, you know, don't really care what state, country, or municipality they're in. Um, we work to restore and protect freshwater aquatic habitats uh, to ensure that fish have free and open access in, in healthy waters. Um, and we also manage the National Fish Hatchery System, which this year is in its 150th year. So a pretty old system there as well. So I guess I say all that to kind of beg the question, you know, what am I doing here talking about urban fishing programs, urban recreation programs? Um, if you look at our mission there, you'll see that most of our work, you know, as we said, is focused first and foremost on the needs and threats to wild animals. And in fact, most of our national wildlife refuges and nearly all of our fish hatcheries um, are located far from urban centers. Next, Joanne, I'll try and remember to say that. Um, but the reality is that the people we serve are really at the beginning and the very end of our mission. It's bookended by the communities that we serve. And what's more, the very foundations of the agency 150 years ago, um, back to the U.S. Commission on Fish and Fisheries, which is how we started, um, was formed to ensure that Americans had enough fish to catch, right? The people who were out in nature relying on fishing for food and economic development and to care for their communities through subsistence um, were recognizing that fish populations were crashing and that's really kind of how the agency got its start. So we understand intrinsically that the connections between fishing and conservation, between fishing and stewardship, um, between fishing and people's experience of the national world uh, those connections are deep and meaningful. Next. Um, today, however, 80% uh, of Americans live in cities, um, seemingly cut off from the natural world, but I guess really are they? Um, 
the problem is when people come to view themselves as separate from nature, they become less able to take part in conservation, less likely to view conservation, wildlife and nature um, as things that are intrinsic parts of their lives. Um, but I think, you know, the reality that we're becoming to grapple with is that um, honestly, many of us in the conservation community have unintentionally fostered that disconnect by encouraging the idea of wildness is out there, you know, cities here as wilderness and nature as things that are outside of our lived lives, something that we have to travel to. Um, um, and instead, not focusing as much on the nature that's surrounding us, um, even in our cities. And when we did that, we left behind a lot of people who didn't feel welcome um, in those spaces we were protecting or represented by the picture of nature that we were, that we were um, putting out there. Next. and enter the Urban Wildlife Conservation Program. So this program started uh, 10 years ago within the National Wildlife Refuge System and a recognition that much of our work was in these wild open spaces far from people and their agency and our work was excluding a lot of the communities um, where our constituents lived and the people that we needed to be um, a part of our work in order for us to protect the, uh, the natural world. Um, today there are over 100 urban refuges, and we define that as a refuge within 25 miles of a city of uh, 250,000 people or more. Uh, we have 30 urban bird treaty cities, and I'll touch on this at the close of, of our talk today after Katrina goes, um, but those are our partnership agreements within urban cities focused on habitat conservation, education uh, around migratory birds. We have 32 urban partnership cities, and these are cities where we, we recognize the important need of, of conservation there, but we don't necessarily maybe have a land base. We don't have a refuge or a hatchery or, or anything that like that nearby. We don't have that kind of skin in the game, but we have important conservation goals there. And so we partner directly with the city and with other entities. Um, at the core of this program um, are, um, <laughs> it's okay, um, either way it's fine. At the core of this program are standards of excellence and commitment to being inclusive, intentional, collaborative, and community focused. <clears throat> and in fact, right now we're at work within the agency of taking this program that started within just the refuge system and looking at how do we apply this to our work broadly? How can we allow it to redefine and reimagine the ways that we are with and within communities? So I'm going to take you on, on a brief tour of some of the fishing programs um, under the Urban Wildlife Conservation Program that exists today. Um, I'll, we'll just touch on it briefly so you can see some of what's happening and then we'll turn it over to Katrina to really get into depth on the work they're doing in Anchorage um, and it's just really cool work that she she's doing out there. Next. So a great first place to start when we're looking at um, urban engagement and urban fishing programs is John Hines at Tinicum National Wildlife Refuge in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. <clears throat> Now, there is a little bit of, of back and forth as to who's the first urban refuge. Um, John Hines is certainly one of the first urban national wildlife refuges, and they were established in 1972 <clears throat> as a refuge. And it is um, today a treasured green space. It's right in downtown Philadelphia. It's full of rich wildlife uh, plants native to the Delaware estuary. The refuge has uh, a lot of different habitats, tidal marshes, open waters, mud flats, and it's right in downtown Philadelphia. Um, they are located in, and most importantly, a part of the community there in Philadelphia that where they exist. Um, but that wasn't always the case. Um, early in the refuge, they were sort of separate, and we had, there was some uh, a new wildlife refuge manager, and the urban program really took an intentional effort to take this refuge and make it a part of the community. And so they started doing things like not just inviting the community to come to us, right? but let's actually go out into the community. So they went out and started doing pop-up nature walks and um, really um, actively having a, an outdoor recreation program where they were going out to the community as well as inviting them in and making themselves an integral part of, of the folks' lives that were living there um, and really making themselves a community asset, right? Um, somewhere where people felt not only welcome but they felt themselves reflected in the, the natural world around them. Their urban fishing program um, provides all of the gear, is regular and is led by members often of the community as well as staff from the refuge. So again, that success is built on their ability to be a part of the community in which they exist. Next. Sorry, I had to cough there for a second. Ah, 
second really um, in terms of intentionality is Don Edwards National Wildlife Refuge is another great example of uh, a, a, a refuge that's really uh, intentionally going out into the community uh, to make itself a community asset. Don Edwards is located in what is now California's high tech industry, um, <clears throat> but is also a part of the historic communities of Oakland and Fremont there in California. It is, um, along with John Hines, one of the first urban, uh, large urban national wildlife refuges. Um, and it is just an incredibly uh, wildlife oasis right in a huge urban setting. Um, it provides critical habitat for threatened and endangered species, but also um, a refuge and habitat for the people to enjoy the benefits of nature. <clears throat> Apologies, I'm getting over a cold and it's still living in my throat here. Try not to cough at you guys while I'm talking. Um, in recent years, they've really become a started uh, developing a really robust urban fishing outreach program focused on young anglers um, and really focused on uh, partnering in the community. So it's not just the refuge. When they do these events, they're doing them um, in partnership with Latino Outdoors or other of the community um, organizations around the Oakland and uh, Fremont area. Ooh, sorry. Um, next. Um, uh, another great partnership that I uh, just want to feature briefly up to a different corner of the country is up around Lacey, Washington, which is in the, the Seattle urban area. It's nestled in between um, tribal lands, the city of Olympia, Tacoma, and just south of, <clears throat> of Seattle. Uh, now, there's not an urban refuge right there, but in fact, we have a large fisheries complex that surrounds that area of three um, fairly rural hatcheries and a, and a fisheries conservation office. So, you know, what do you do? You don't actually have land in that space, but you want to reach out to your community and help bring fishing to them. So they partner with local organizations. They, again, will support the program through uh, uh, funding and coordination. They partner with cities and municipalities in the in the greater Seattle area, as well as groups like Big Brothers and Big Sisters. They coordinate with volunteer community anglers um, and just find ways to, again, focus on youth and bringing um, young people into fishing for the first time. And it's a great example of, of how you can use community assets um, when we don't necessarily have a refuge or other space. Next. And then finally, um, Anchorage, and I'll actually, I'm right at my time, so I will allow Katrina to really go into depth on this, um, but I think she and the work they're doing up there is just in a great example of community-focused work that really um, is an asset to the community um, and uh, brings new people into, into angling and conservation. So I'll pass it on and hopefully awesome. um, start coughing offline. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Holly. Can you guys hear me okay? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hope for the best here. Um, yeah, so Marie and I are really happy to welcome y'all to Anchorage, Alaska. It's the largest city in our beautiful states. Um, I've been living here since 2010, started this program in 2011, and since then it's really grown exponentially. Um, we've had help from a, a ton of great folks like Marie, who you're going to hear from in a little bit. We've had some just amazing interns and directorate fellows and partners who have really shaped um, where we are today and we're excited to share um, our Anchorage fishing program today and answer any questions you have at the end here. Um, so this is actually a, a, one of my favorite photos. This is at Chip Creek right here in downtown Anchorage. Um, we're fishing for pink salmon and this is some, a trip that we do kind of later in the summer which I'll get into. Uh, next, Joy. Okay, so Anchorage, Alaska, um, it's our largest city, as I mentioned. So we've got just under 300,000 people living here. Um, you can see those beautiful mountains in the background. Those are the Chugach Mountains. Um, we've got some amazing salmon streams right going through town. Uh, salmon, trout, char, um, some stock lakes. So it's actually a really neat city. There's a ton of opportunity to fish. Uh, despite this, though, what we were noticing when we first started is that a lot of the kids here, um, particularly in certain neighborhoods, they, they've never touched the water. They don't really go outside. Um, their caregivers don't have the know-how to fish. Um, 
so there's really kind of this big spectrum of how folks engage here with some of them not engaging at all in fishing and some of them really being involved. Parents are taking them out. They're going all over the state fishing and hunting. Um, so we really wanted to kind of focus in and see if we could help um, more folks get involved. Um, I'll also mention that Anchorage is one of the top um, you know, for school diversity in the in the nation. So it's kind of a cool thing I didn't know before I moved up here. Next. Okay, so kind of at a, a broader level, we, we went through some strategic planning this last year for our, our larger Anchorage program that goes beyond fishing. It also includes, Holly mentioned, birds um, and different wildlife topics. Um, but essentially what we're hoping to do largely is really facilitate meaningful and inclusive connections um, within you know, these urban spaces in Alaska, here in Anchorage, here in Fairbanks. Um, how we're doing that is providing expertise, funding. Um, we're hoping to inspire kids and their caregivers. Um, and one of the big things I'll also get into is we're really trying to figure out what some of those barriers are and how to address those. Um, and also just investing in all of those partnerships that Holly mentioned. Next. Okay, so what we're hoping and what we're striving towards are really outdoor spaces that are welcoming and accessible to people from diverse backgrounds and perspectives. Um, we're trying to, you know, make these places where people can form their favorite memories, uh, form routine, uh, find well-being. Um, a lot of what we do kind of revolves around relationship building with the kids, with the community. Um, something here in Alaska that's really cool is there's a lot of wild foods um, and it's actually a really big thing for a lot of people here. So we're teaching kids how to actually collect those, how to share those, um, and then really promote that longer term stewardship um, and conservation kind of mindedness that uh, folks can develop over time. Um, and just create that norm where it's okay to be outdoorsy um, in a safe way and culturally affirming, affirming ways as well. Next. Okay, so specifically for the urban fishing program, we've got some, some goals here. Um, one of the biggest goals we have is really fostering competency and confidence in the outdoors and with fishing specifically. Um, and what we're finding is that takes a lot of time to do. Um, and that's going to lead into what I'm going to talk about in terms of our strategy. Um, as we're doing that over the, uh, over the course of a year and over the years, it's really um, focusing in on recruiting folks into fishing who haven't fished before and then retaining them. So that's a, a big part of what we're doing with our programming and how we structure it. Um, and then a, a kind of longer term goal is that conservation piece that I mentioned, stewardship, um, stewardship of the waters here in town, of the lands here in Alaska and of, of, native, of native fishes. Next. Okay, so our, our primary audience here in Anchorage is diverse Anchorage youth and their organization staff, also their caregivers. Um, this is kind of a typical group that we work with. This is a group of kids from the Northeast Muldoon Boys and Girls Club. This is a pretty large group. Um, in the background there is Cheney Lake. That's about a mile from their clubhouse. Um, and here in Anchorage, there's a lot of stock lakes. So we've got, um, the state of Alaska Department of Fishing Game, they stock these lakes and it's stocked with things like um, salmon, trout, char. That's what we go after in the lakes here. You can see they, the kids are pretty happy. We've been fishing. Uh, they all got some smiles on their faces. And um, this is like a, a pretty normal group of kids that we would work with on a day-to-day -day basis. Next. I wanted to put a slide in um, that kind of shows why we've chosen to go with um, the audience that I mentioned in the slide above. Um, you can see here, um, this is some census data and also some data from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Survey that's done every 10 years or so, I think. Um, so if you look at like, for example, the US population in 2010 and kind of the breakdown of race there, uh, it looks a little bit different than what it does for anglers. So we don't wanna see that disproportionality, especially um, when we're trying to serve the entire American public, we wanna try to get those to look more similar. So that's that's one reason um, that we've chosen um, to kind of you know really focus on diverse neighborhoods here in Anchorage. You can also see over there on the right, those slides um, related to the you know, male versus female um, kind of breakdown for the US population versus um, for anglers. So you can see that there's some disproportionality there. 
Um, and it can really kind of obscure the values that underrepresented groups bring to the table and derive from America's fisheries and public agencies. So that's something that we're focused on through the years and really want to address and get at. Next. Okay, so what barriers do kids face here in Anchorage? And this is a question we've been asking for a while. Um, we've had a lot of conversations with kids over the year. We've actually done a small formal survey where we ask them some pretty pretty specific questions about what um, kind of prevents them from going outside or getting into fishing. Um, and I've got three kind of big categories here that I'm gonna dig into a bit. Um, the first one we found is really just fear. Um, here in town, there's, there's wildlife. We've got black bears, we've got brown bears, we've got moose, and they can all be kind of dangerous if you don't know how to behave around them and you don't know their behavior. Um, so that's definitely something that's come up um, with kids and with caregivers. Getting lost is another thing that um, kids are afraid of. Um, and then related to water, um, drowning, falling in, um, lots of kids saying, you know, they're scared to get pulled in, pulled in by a shark, pulled in by big fish. And what we notice is like, those are, those are big topics, but those are all things that we can address through education. Like when we're fishing in a lake, when we're fishing in a stream here, we're not going to be catching sharks. Um, drowning is something that we can address through cold water safety, which I'm going to talk about. And that's something that we really worked with the state of Alaska to address. Um, and other partners, we had a great director, a fellow who I think is listening in, who really kicked us off with their safety program related to cold water safety um, three or so years ago. Um, getting lost is something that we're also addressing through orienteering, map reading, and then with wildlife, it's something that you know our agency and other agencies can really help with in terms of getting these kids kind of knowledge about, about animal behavior and how to, how to behave around animals. Um, some of the other barriers are just not knowing how, so not knowing how to cast a rod, not knowing how to use an open-faced reel, um, not knowing about fish behavior, or fish ID, or how current um, affects how fish behave. So a lot of, you know, things that we can actually work together to address for these kids. And then the final piece is really not having the gear. You know, it can be expensive to get into fishing um, here in Alaska. Uh, if you're going to be going in the water, it's cold. You need waders, um, having the actual fishing gear. Some of the fish species here, like the larger salmon species, you need um, heavier equipment um, and it can be expensive. So that's something that we can help with in terms of providing that gear. Next. Okay, so our strategy. Um, the first year we ran the program, it was kind of a one shot event took the kids down to Ship Creek, which you saw in that first photograph. Um, it's very muddy, it's tidal, um, and they hadn't fished before. And it was it was a little bit of a mess, to be honest. Um, and we really started figuring out that we're gonna need to have some repeat interactions with the same kids to get them to a point where they can actually become competent fishing and confident fishing. So that's kind of how this strategy was um, devised over time. So we really wanna have repeat interactions with kids you know, within a year and also across years. Um, building that competence and confidence, that's something we do through all of our program, programming all summer long. Um, and also things like fun and food and camaraderie. So these are kids, they wanna have fun. Uh, we try to structure our education in a way that's fun and not boring for them. Um, food is something that we determined is actually really important too. Um, a few years ago, we noticed that a lot of kids didn't have lunch and they were getting kind of tired and grouchy while we were fishing. Um, so actually bringing food, providing food, um, that's what really kicked off the, the cooking component of this um, program. Uh, we, we've noticed that if we ask the kids if they wanna keep the fish or let them go, pretty much 100% of the times they say what they wanna keep the fish. They wanna bring it home to grandma, they wanna take it home to their family, they wanna eat it. So we actually started cooking the fish we caught on site and also sending kids home with the fish. Um, and then the camaraderie is just, you know, we're a group um, kind of learning together. And if you're having repeat interactions with people, you're going to build that camaraderie and teamwork. And um, that's something that we find is important with this program as well. Um, another really important piece of the strategy is staff consistency and diversity. 
Um, again, we're building relationships with the, these kids through time to help them feel comfortable outdoors in these different situations. And we find that if we have, you know, the same staff and familiar faces through time, uh, the kids really start to kind of bond with you and open up and you can have those conversations about fish and wildlife conservation and whatever is on their mind. Um, so that consistency is important. Also diversity. Um, I did notice we had a lot, um, there's a lot of males in the sport of fishing, which is great, but um, we would see a lot of like boys sticking with the program. So once we started hiring um, more women into some of our internship positions, we were seeing more girls sticking with us. So that piece is important. And also kids just being able to see themselves represented amongst the staff is important, I think, for outdoor programming. It helps the kids feel comfortable helps them see themselves in the activities we're doing. Um, and it's just something that we're noticing through time that these two pieces of our staffing is important. And then the final piece of the strategy is of course, just providing the gear and instruction that these kids need. Uh, next. Okay, so in terms of how that strategy is broken up, we really have two um, pieces of it. We've got our in-person engagement, so that's, during the summertime, the setting is primarily outdoors in Anchorage at lakes and streams, um, but we also have had, uh, you know, classroom portions, uh, some of the map reading, some of the first aid, some of that just lends itself better to being in a classroom uh, where you can um, kind of spread out, have a controlled situation, um, and also uh, the pool. So the pool is again a controlled situation where we can start addressing some of those barriers related to um, fear of water um, and really just being safe near water here in Alaska where it's, it's cold and that's something that's um, maybe different than some of the other places um, where folks are listening from on this call, but that's, that's something really important here and the pool was a really great setup um, in terms of addressing that. Uh, the other piece of the strategy is virtual engagement. Um, we hadn't been doing this until COVID hit, but when COVID hit, we weren't actually able to go out with the kids for that first summer. Um, and we we're like, okay, how are we going to stay connected with them? And we formed Youth Fish and Wildlife Club. And you can see Riley up there in the upper right. And she was our intern that summer. And she really like built this program from the ground up. Maria's taking it over now and working on it and making it great. Um, but it's, it's really been great. And the kids, um, they stay connected with us now throughout the year. So we've got basically a fall um, programming and a spring programming session where we meet with the kids once a week over Zoom. You can see over here on the right, the kids are learning how to draw a sockeye salmon from one of our um, digital artists here in the Fish and Wildlife here in Alaska. Um, and it, it looks fun, but it's also they're learning like, you know, where what's the fin placement? You know, what's the coloration of these fish? It helps with fish ID. So there's a lot you can actually do online um, when you're maybe not doing an outdoor event um, and you've got different resources. So we really like this virtual piece of engagement as well. Next. Um, the in-person engagement takes place now from um, June 1st through mid-August annually. Schools here in Anchorage get out May 20th generally, so this gives the kids about a week and a half to transition to the Boys and Girls Club, which are the primary hubs that we work with here in town. Um, and it, it, the, the fishing season here at Anchorage, I mean, it really starts out where the salmon come in a little bit later. And you've got, you know, king salmon coming in first, um, you've got, you know, pinks and cohos. So there is some seasonality to it. So when we, we start off, um, you're really starting in lakes, you're fishing for stockfish, you're fishing with easy gear, learning how to cast, um, going somewhere where there's like a lot of shoreline, not a lot of trees. And then each week is really building on the next. So as the summer progresses, we'll fish at Cheney Lake first, and then we'll fish at a, a lake uh, that's a little more wooded. Um, we'll move over to Taku Lake, which is right next to Campbell Creek. So some of the kids that are new or very small, like these girls on the right, they can fish at the lake with staff. And then we can take some of the bigger kids over to the, the creek and they can learn about currents. Um, so each week is building on the prior. And then again, we'll have a, a mix of mostly outdoor settings, but also a little bit of classroom setting and some pool settings as well. Next. Okay, so what we teach, I mentioned lake fishing with bobbers. That's like our entry entry for these kids. We've got closed face uh, reels that they use. Then we work on fishing in current. And if you think about how to actually fish in current, it's actually pretty complicated. You have to know a little bit about fish behavior. You know, fish are gonna be holding behind structure like 
rocks or near submerged wood or along a cut bank. Um, if you need to move spots, how are you going to get to the next spot? Are you going to have to cross a river? Are you going to be able to do that in a safe way? So it's actually a pretty complicated scenario for kids to learn and for adults to learn. So this is something we focus on a lot. Um, we also teach about cooking, uh, safe cooking, keeping your catch clean, keeping it on ice. Um, the cold water sa safety and river crossing is a big piece of this, just general outdoor preparedness. Um, and something we've added over the more recent years is thanking the fish we harvest. Um, so if you catch a fish, you're going to harvest it, you're going to take its life, you're going to eat it. Um, we're going to be thankful for that. So before we bog the fish on the head, we say, thank you, fish. And all the kids just say it now. They're just kind of used to, to saying that phrase. And I think it um, translates largely kind of into that stewardship piece that we're looking for long term. When you go home and you take the fish home, like you're thankful for that meal and you're thankful for those fish. So that's something we're trying to teach the kids as well. Next. And I am going to pass it to Marie, and she's going to take you through kind of what a typical summer here looks like. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so my name is Marie. Um, I'm one of the interns. Been working with Katrina for the past year and a half, and we can get into the pictures now. Um, so as you can see in this picture, we have two different sets of rods that we use with the kids. So the first reels are our closed face reels. Um, or button reels, we start them off with this just to get them uh, interested in the sport. Uh, a lot of kids that we take out fishing never been fishing before. So this is um, a way to attract them to keep uh, joining us for the rest of the summer. And then if you look to the left, I mean, I'm sorry, to the right, that's the picture of our bigger reels that we use for salmon. So when we're going to Ship Creek or we're going to Hope, Alaska, um, teaching them how to use both reels are really great because that gives them the chance to know how to use all um, fishing reels. Uh, if you go to the next picture. Um, this picture here, these are the waders that we've gotten through the Fish and Wildlife Service funds. Um, as I've been here, I've started to see that a lot of the kids that are coming in are more mature and more developed. So this past summer, we really worked hard on spending our money on getting um, waders for some of the girls that are a little bit curvier or you got some of the guys that are more bigger and buff and built. So doing this is really a good way of getting the, the kids interested because um, it's been times where I've been discouraged for not wanting to do a sport because the equipment didn't fit me. So we are really trying to focus on getting the kids the right equipment so that they can stay um, encouraged through the whole entire summer. Um, the next picture, please. So in this picture here, um, this past summer was our first year working with a group of kids from Afghanistan. A lot, some of the kids, well, most of the kids in this uh, group never been fishing before. So by doing this, this really, like, it let them see that they can do anything they want by seeing someone that's a um, different race um, as well with them, uh, because this sport is mainly white people. So whenever they go out fishing, one of the kids from they were discouraged. So just by seeing someone else that was a minority, it encouraged them that they can do anything. But in this picture, I'm just teaching him the difference of how to use a bobber and a spinner. And as you can see, he's really uh, listening to me. He was really excited this day. He was a good kid. Um, but we can go to the next picture. So this is another intern from the previous years. I never got to meet him, but he was through Alaska Geographic um, as well as I was. So um, here he is teaching the kids uh, how to use um, our eggs. So whenever we're fishing, we try to teach the kids only use an egg when you use a bobber. And um, whenever you use a spinner, don't use eggs because it's not the proper etiquette. So we're trying to uh, teach them fishing etiquettes as well. Go to the next picture, please. So um, this is a picture of us in Ship Creek. Uh, so we're working in the car. Um, a lot of the cars that we got over the years or um, refuge let us use it. Um, we're really trying to work on getting our own equipment. So our own gear and our own vehicle. It can help with transporting. Um, last, not last year, but the year before um, me and Riley, the other intern, we did have a difficult time getting gear around. We had a smaller car. And luckily, I'm very grateful that Migratory Birds had an intern last uh, this last summer, and they had a truck, so we were able to share the vehicle to get our gear around. So we're working on getting um, 
our own truck and our own trailer or Connex. Uh, you can go to the next picture. So this is one of our coworkers, Chris. He's really cool. <laughs> In this picture, you can see that he's going over cold water safety. We're just trying to get the kids um, to be more confident in themselves when we're walking in water because there are situations when we're fishing, we have to go across current. So first thing we do is we teach them about it because most of the kids are scared. They never been around current before and you can see the fear in their eyes. By, by us showing them they can do it, that helps encourage them and, they, and they're like starting to feel that they can do it themselves. So if you go to the next picture, you can see that um, Chris is in the water. <laughs> so we, we give live demonstrations to the kids and they think it's so cool and so funny, but that's also good because the laughter shows that they're getting more comfortable around the water. So they're not going to be scared when it's time for them to go in. If you go to the next picture. So this is us using our buddy system. So we're trying to teach kids how if you put the bigger person in front, that can break the current for the person behind them. So we were teaching them how to I said before, just how to cross uh, current responsibly because there are situations where you, you might fall in. As in the previous picture, Chris told you, was showing us how to uh, save ourselves if that happened. If you go to the next picture, please. So as you see, the kids got smiles. They're very excited. Um, so you can see that the current's a little fast. So most of the kids <laughs> that I've worked with, they always say, oh, Marie, I can do it, I can do it. And then they get a little taste of it and they're like, oh, this is really scary. So just showing this uh, to them is giving them the chance to be like, okay, it's good to learn things. It's okay to be patient because not everyone is good at everything. So we have some kids who feel discouraged, but once I get out with them or we have other kids that encourage them, they start to feel more comfortable. If you go to the next picture, please. So again, <laughs> This is us using our buddy system as well. So bigger, uh, bigger kid in front to help break up the current for the kids in the back. And, um, and this is when the waders really come in use for the kids um, that are a little bit more built and more curvier. We want them to be able to experience the same thing everyone else is doing. If you go to the next picture, please. So with this as well, we're showing the kids how to cross with their reels in their, hand, in their hands. Um, I believe this is at Taco Lake or Little Campbell Creek. We uh, usually cross, this is where we're gonna fish for char or native trout in the creek. And sometimes we have to cross over so that the fish can't see us when we're casting out. So um, we, we, we cross with our fishing rods and everything. If you go to the next picture, please. So here are some very good pictures of the kids joining our program. So, um, as you can see, the first kid has a rainbow trout, and then the next two have salmon. So whenever we're fishing, we're just not get letting them have all the fishes. We're trying to teach them how to do fishing ID. Um, as you can see, dark skin with light spots will be a char, and then light skin or dark spots will either be a trout or a salmon. So if you can look on the tails um, of the salmon, the one in the middle and the one to the right, on the tail of their spots. So we can tell that's one way of the salmon, but also by this hump on this back, that's how we know it's a humpy or a pink salmon. But we're trying to teach the kids how to identify their fish before they take them and bonk them. And that's when we come in, that's where we come in telling them to say thank you to the fish. Uh, we can go to the next picture. So in this first picture, you see the little girl touching her friend's hand and he's touching fish. So some of the kids that we work with are really scared of touching fish. Um, they never been around fishes that much, so I can understand. Um, so she's feeling more comfortable by just touching him and letting him touch the fish, but it's still making her feel more comfortable being around. It's been times where I've been fishing with the kids. I had a little girl come up to me one time. I was like, I didn't know we did this kind of stuff. And that's when I was like, what do you mean by we? She was like, you know, black people or girls. I didn't know we did this kind of stuff. So just by them seeing people that look like them really helps encourage them to get more involved in the sport. Um, and especially from them being um, inner city kids, just like I was growing up, I never got the chance to do this. If you go to the next picture. So yeah, so this is in Hope. You can see a lot of kids are really happy. We uh, 
will let them keep their fishes. And if you go to the next picture, you can see um, us teaching them how to harvest the fish. So we're teaching them how to fillet them, how to gut them. And you can see they're really interested in by doing that. Most of the kids that we go fishing with, they want to take their fish home. So if we're letting them take them home, we got to teach them how to gut it first and how to cook it. So if you go to the next picture. So here, here we are um, harvesting the fish outside cooking with the kids. Um, they're really excited about it. I was excited for them. <laughs> um, I wasn't able to be here during this. This is before COVID. But a lot of kids that come back from doing this with Katrina, they always say, oh, when are we going to do cooking again, Marie? I really enjoyed it. I really had fun. I taught my mom how to cook a fish. I taught my mom how to fillet the fish. So we're, we're by doing this program, we know we're touching the kid's life. Uh, you can go to the next picture. Again, here we go. The kids are seasoning their own fish. Um, at least they're able to go home with a full stomach. It's just letting them know that by taking that fish's life, we're actually going to put it to good use. So they know they're going to actually eat the fish and not just be putting the fish out of its life just for fun. We're actually going to put it to use and not let it go to waste. Um, you can go to the next picture, please. So in this picture here, uh, we're letting them use a butter knife just so that they can practice. Some of the older kids, we actually do let them use the actual fillet knife. But just by doing this, it lets them have the more hands-on experience. So they're able to go up to the fish, touch on it. They'll do the practice cut, showed us what we would do. But um, just doing this, let the kids know that they can do it on their own. Uh, you can go to the next picture, please. So here we go again. Um, you see all our fishies are cut up, getting them ready to cook and season down. And if you go to the next picture, um, this is at one of the boys and girls clubs we work with in Modum. They were nice enough to let us use their kitchen. So this is all the fish we caught and one day with the kids, brought it back to their clubhouse and we cooked with them. And just by cooking with them, help us build a more relationship with the kids. That's when they start to feel a little bit more comfortable. They tell us, just telling us how much fun they had, how they never done anything like this before. So just by doing this, we're touching, we're letting the kids know that they can do this on their own if they wanted to go fishing by themselves without us. Uh, you can go to the next picture. And this is when Katrina comes back on. Thank you for listening to me today. Thanks, Marie. Um, yeah, and I know we're kind of getting close on time here, so we'll, we'll get through this quick. Um, so Marie did a great job talking us through kind of a typical summer. And then in terms of the virtual piece, um, I mentioned it bridges our summer program. It's Virtual Youth Fish and Wildlife Club. Uh, Marie's working right now on getting the fall schedule set. And um, yeah, we, we co-design it with, um, with the clubs and across Fish and Wildlife and with partners. Um, she's going to be chatting with the kids this next week, I think, or in a couple of weeks about stuff they want to learn over this next year. So if they want to learn about volcanoes, we're going to talk about our, our coastal refuges. If they want to learn about fish ID, that's something that we're going to cover. Um, we can learn about, you know, our only bat species up here or just kind of whatever they want to learn about. Um, we've covered a whole lot of different topics through this uh, virtual club. Uh, next, please. Maybe if, I don't know if Marie, if you want to pop on for this slide, but this is just an example of what it looks like. Uh, we do these over Zoom. Uh, they run about a half hour. Um, you can see Helen up there in the upper left. She's from Refuges and has been a great partner in this program. We've got Riley up there in the upper right. We've got a bunch of kids. They had individual devices that first year COVID and mass up in their clubs. But um, yeah, it's just, it was, it's just a fun way to, to chat with them online and keep those connections. And Marie, do you got anything to add for this slide? Um, the only thing I could say is just by us doing our Zoom classes with the kids is still helping us build our relationship with them so that they can at least know us when we come in person. Yeah, so we'll get them excited about this summer and be like, yeah, we're going to be starting soon, so get ready for fishing. Um, next. Okay, so real quickly on partnerships, um, we've got kind of some big categories on how the partnerships are structured, but really staffing, it's supported through Fish and Wildlife, both locally with our staff, like myself and, and Chris and others and Helen. Um, we've had staffing support through headquarters. 
with our directorate fellows program, which has actually brought on folks like Chris and um, just some great um, projects have come out of that. Um, the Student Conservation Association, we've got Marie and Riley through that, and then Alaska Geographic's been a great partner. Um, we've got a NIFWF grant with them, and they've been providing intern support for the past, I think, four years, three or four years, which has been great. Um, instruction has been through the service, um, through Alaska DNR, which I'll just mention briefly at the end with some photos. Um, military base, we've got Joint Base Elmendorf Richardson, right north of Anchorage here, um, Anchorage Fire Department, just different groups that really um, can hit at some of those barriers that we're trying to, to address with these kids. And then in terms of transportation, um, in addition to the just the, the major hubs of the Boys and Girls Club and groups like Denali Family Services, um, they provide the transportation, which is super helpful. Um, we can't actually do that through fish and wildlife and transporting other kids. So that's been a key part of it. And then Alaska Geographic um, was great this last year. They let us use their, their van um, and Marie was able to drive that and transport some of the kids from the clubs that didn't have vehicle access this year to places like Hope and different places around town. Next, please. Um, here is just some of those groups that I've mentioned. So the Boys and Girls Club, they've been a partner since the very beginning. Denali Family Services, we've partnered with them the past three or four years. They've been great, very consistent partner. Um, the Refugee Assistance Program, um, that's a new partner as of this year. We did a couple pilot events and Marie mentioned those kids from Afghanistan. This program actually helps um, kids over, I think a period of about five years, really get integrated into the community. So we're looking forward to building that out with them this next year and in the years to come. Um, you can see SCA and Alaska Geographic there and then some of the more technical groups that actually provide the instruction like JBEAR and the Alaska Boating Safety Program. It's a state program. Um, next, please. And then successes, uh, how we measure that is really, um, you know, kids catching fish. Even when they don't catch fish, that's okay. We have a lot of fun learning activities that they experience. Um, another way we measure success is seeing kids returning week to week and year to year. You can see that kid in the red shirt holding the fish. Um, this was probably four years ago in our last program of this year. He was out with us in Hope, got to take some salmon home. He actually got a fillet of salmon this year, which was really cool for him. Um, the partnership longevity is another piece of the success. Um, same as like the staff um, consistency, really having the partner longevity um, that's been a, a key piece of this program um, and then reaching our target audience of course next please um, okay so how state agencies can get involved i think it really depends on um, your kind of localized situation here for us in anchorage um, when we looked at the barriers these kids are facing and we really identified that cold water safety piece as a key barrier um, that really kind of led us to the the DNR here um, who runs the, the boating safety program, the Kids Don't Float program. Um, and that's you know been a very consistent, great partnership with them. Um, we make sure to coordinate at the beginning of the summer where they can um, make sure that they're coming out to events where you know each club is gonna get um, information about cold water safety through them. So I think it kind of depends on what your situation is. Um, I think uh, other states, it might be more like partnering with the, the Fish and Game Department. We've definitely partnered with them here as well, but um, the, the DNR piece has been a really neat kind of maybe unique example of working with um, the states and we're going to cross partnerships to kind of really get at a specific barrier. Um, and again, the program is co-designed. So we, we work with the community um, and the community kind of lets us know, you know, this is this is what we need and it's co-designed. So it seems like there's always the opportunity for new partners from the state and from other um, organizations to join. Next, please. And these are just a couple pictures of the state agency that we work with the most. This is the DNR. Um, this is at West Pool here in Anchorage. Um, you can see, yeah, these kids are getting some instruction on life jacket use. Um, life jacket use is something really important to prevent drowning. So we wanna make sure kids know how to properly put one on, make sure it's fitted properly where it's not going up over the head if they go in the water. Um, we actually had them go in the water and try to put a life jacket on, not on shore, and it's it's pretty hard. So it makes the point that you want to have that on uh, proactively. Uh, you can see someone from the DNR there in the pool instructing them. Next, please. 
this is just showing a group of kids um, with one of our DNR partners. They're in a group. Um, they're, that's a way to kind of keep warm in the water and make sure you stay together. You can see there's some kids in the middle there. It actually does warm the water up slightly with your body heat. Um, you can see kids in the background there practicing a throw rope uh, to a friend in distress in the water. And again, this is a very controlled situation with a lot of staff in the water helping these kids. Next, please. Um, we haven't integrated canoes yet into our program. We're hoping to here at some point. This is just a, a fun thing we do at the pool with them to get them, you know, feeling comfortable in a small boat that you might come across here in Alaska. Um, actually, we have them sit in the canoe. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, we actually tip the canoe in a very controlled situation. The kids um, learn how to get back in the canoe from the water. You can see the DNR instructor there. She's been, uh, she's been out with us multiple years. It's great to work with um, and the kids are they're having fun they're a little nervous but this is something where over the three or four sessions they come to the pool they actually go from like kind of clinging to chris or clinging to staff being afraid of being in the water to being able to navigate if a canoe actually tips over um, i don't have a picture of us doing this but we actually bring our waders to the pool and show kids what it feels like to fill your waders with water that's before we would go to the creek and this is something we're hoping to do more of um, once and as COVID gets a little bit more under control. Um, and I think that's it, Joanne, if you wanna hit the next one and I guess Holly, I'll pass it to you. Oh, there we go, now I'm unmuted. And actually you can scoot on to the next one, Joanne. Um, and I, I know I wanna make sure we save enough time for plenty of questions for Marie and Katrina. So I'll just wrap up really quickly, uh, which is to say that we really, we believe like the most important way that we can reach um, new audiences that we can make sure our agencies and our work are reflective of the communities and are a part of communities and do good work for conservation is that we can't message our way into diverse engagement. It takes long-term consistent commitment like you heard Katrina just talking about. It takes a willingness to make sure that your staff and your uh, employees are reflective of the communities they're working in, a willingness to change and adapt, and an openness to co-creating things. Uh, so we're really excited to do this, continue doing this work with uh, you guys, with other partners as well. Um, if you're interested in the, the fastest way to get involved, if you want to look at this, is just pull up the map, find a refuge or hatchery near you, and just reach out to whatever the closest facility is to where you are, um, and reach out to them that way. Uh, lots of folks are open to that. You could reach out to larger regional partnerships. You want to do something bigger. Angelina Yost um, heads the Urban Wildlife Conservation Program naturally, nationally, and that is for the um, Urban Bird Treaty Program as well. So if you would like more information about, you know, just start getting some information about how that program works, um, you can reach out to Angelina. Reach out to myself um, as well for if you want to start discussing uh, larger urban fishing partnerships in your city, uh, feel free to reach out to me as well. Um, and then I'd like to just make sure we're saving plenty of time for questions for Katrina and Marie. Great, thank you all very much. That was some great information. And I think a lot of ideas that can be put into other programs across across the country. Um, we do have a handful of questions, a few questions, so I will read them out loud. Then um, we can um, have Katrina, Holly, or Marie answer. So actually the first one is a quick question. Um, how long is a typical day for the summer program? Marie, feel free to hop on too. Um, it depends on if we're fishing locally. So two to three hours seems to really hold the kids' attention. Um, when we travel out of Anchorage to somewhere like Hope, which is a couple hour drive, away um that's a that's like a full day but we tend to run i would say a couple hours and murray feel free to jump in if you got any more thoughts on kind of like the time for these kids it's all very local here in anchorage it's close to their club so we don't do a ton of long traveling here in town yeah that sounds about right we usually do about two to three hours a lot of kids um uh, they get bored easily they're just kids so we're trying not to we're trying to keep their attention span as long as we can <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, so the next question is somebody looking for a bit of advice. So they said that they have um, fishing tackle available through their local library system that can be checked out. 
but their biggest issue is there's little transportation to get people to actual fishing spots. There's no bus system and Ubers are expensive. Um, also, their peers are a bit outdated and don't have wheelchair stops um, when it comes to disabled people. Um, so, sorry, um, and they have some uh, programs geared towards um, people with special needs. So do you have any better strategies or advice to help them with their programs? Um, and this person's with the Isaac Walton link, just FYI. Oh, cool. Marie, you wanna go first? Okay. Um, yeah, so one of the great um, things about the Boys and Girls Clubs and working with them is they do have their own transportation, and that's definitely something that's a barrier, I think, in a lot of places, and um, we kind of recognize that, and um, that's one of the reasons, in addition to just kind of the, the communities they serve and them being a great help for kids, that transportation piece through the club has been super helpful. Um, we do have a bus system here, but we haven't really gotten into that um, with this program. We have all our own gear stored on site at our field office, our Fish and Wildlife field office here in Econix. Um, we've thought about doing kind of that rental piece, but we do have a lot of just kind of turnover of gear, reels get broken, rod tips get broken, fishing lures get lost. So just having kind of one space where we can have all our gear um, and really keep a handle on the, um, the inventory, I guess, over the summer and year to year, that's been really helpful. So that's how we do it here. Um, I think they're, um, I think those library programs have a great role as well, but that's that's just what we've done with our situation here. Um, and Holly, I'll kick it to you if you get some other thoughts on that one. I do, and it's it's just one that, it, I, I haven't done this program, but I know one of our urban fishing partnerships in Providence, Rhode Island is dealing with the same issue, the transportation piece. Um, and since, you know, they're right in Providence, there is a fairly decent um, transportation network. So they really planned their their work around where public transportation access was, understanding that that was a way that people were going to need to get to the site. Um, so they really planned it around that. And then that really had to pull into the timing as well, because they didn't ever want people to be having to get on and off public transportation late at night with families and really trying to take into account all aspects of that, the safety aspect, you know, the accessibility to transportation. I think the Detroit Urban National Wildlife Refuge, um, which we have an office, we have a fisheries office there as well, and they do a lot of fishing out outreach. Um, they've been working to maybe even work with the city to, to bring public transportation out to the refuge as well. So I think there's big solutions like that that are infrastructure based, but then the smaller ones are just like making sure you're planning your event somewhere near public transportation. From the accessibility standpoint too, I know here in town, I mean, it's kind of partnering with the city and there's different groups that are focused on that, like having access for wheelchairs along the creeks, but I think there's definitely still a lot of improvements to be made there. Some of the sites we go to, they don't have like a porta potty so there's always kind of that issue as well. Um, but I think, again, that's where partnering with different groups that can really help address some of those things um, would be great probably. Great, thank you. That's, that's a lot of good good ideas. Um, the next question we have is, what kind of feedback do you get from caregivers on putting non-swimming minority kids into water? Marie, you got anything? I can answer too, but go for it if you want. Well, um, I, I have, well, when we're in the waders and going through the current, when we're not in the pools, um, since I was an intern while the pool sessions were um, going on, but I've had um, parents, especially the kids that are from Afghanistan, I think their parents really appreciated it. She was sitting there the whole time and you could just see, you could just see the smile in her face because uh, she even came up to me and was like, oh, they never been in water before. So just by you all teaching them how to go cross current, it helps me a lot because I'm nervous. But the, you see, the kids weren't nervous. So since the kids weren't nervous, they can probably help encourage their parents to be like, hey, it's okay. But just from me working with that group and seeing the mom's reactions, I, I didn't see anything negative. She was very positive in telling me that she really appreciated what we did and what we taught the kids that day. I'll add to that, um, again, working with the Boys and Girls Club, like for going out with our group, um, they've got a different forms the parents have to fill out each time. So they have like, okay, we're going on a field trip with Fish and Wildlife Service. 
we're going to hope kids are going to be wearing waders so the parents are aware of what we're doing and they actually sign uh permission slip through the club so that's another benefit of working through um some kind of organization like birds and girls club or different ones that actually are hubs for kids who have um that connection with the parents and that liability piece kind of taken care of great uh, that's great thank you i think we have time for just maybe one more question we do have a few more but i don't think we have time to get to them so if anyone if we don't get to some of the questions, I will connect the Oscar with the presenters after um, we wrap things up. But let me go ahead and ask one more. Um, do you all have any kind of written curriculum, like a workbook, like a workbook or fishing guide? Holly, you want to take that at all? We got we got some thoughts too. Uh, I mean, we so yeah, so we nationally we do have like a junior angler program that we did in partnership with the National Park Service and some other land agencies a couple years ago. And I can share the web link to that with Joanne if that's something that folks are interested in. And then we also have another one in development that's focused on like junior biologist and training, but those are sort of more generic national, similar to like a junior ranger program sort of thing. Um, but for specific curriculum, I think you guys probably do, Katrina. So it's interesting. We've played around with it over the years. And what we've found the kids like the best is just kind of that conversation on site. So we don't actually rely heavily on any kind of written curriculum other than our staff being really um, prepared, I guess, going into the season related to fish ID, related to the regs, related to the topics we're gonna cover, including the safety, and then just having conversation with kids. So it's not like formal school and we kind of find that with the fun piece of the program when we brought some folks in and they've given like a formal presentation you can see the kids kind of wandering off and getting bored so we do try to integrate um, that learning and curriculum just more verbally with the students and there's probably better ways to do that but that's what we found works up here for our staffing and for the kids sure thanks i feel like having the kids be a part of um giving ideas of what they want to learn is going to make them more interested in it as well. That's great. And I, I will say, I mean, Marie's given presentations over Zoom. So she's, I guess, I mean, that's that's a, a more formal structure, but it's also fun and conversational too. And maybe she could speak to that. Great, thank you. Uh, well, thank, thank you, Katrina, Marie, and Holly. I really appreciate all this information.